High school reunions, we've all been to them and felt that visceral shock of how much classmates have aged in the five or ten years since we've last seen them. And of course we wonder, have we aged that much? The frightening answer is yes, obviously. But you put that aside, get an earful of news, and conjure up those high school memories. Hey Jeff, amazing. You're still with us. You must have learned how to drive at some point. Well, yes I did. Thanks, Robbie. Brake pedal. Discovered it in college, actually. It's a great invention. Wish I'd known about it. Marianne had a great line at this 45th union about what our reunion photo might be used for. Oh, are we going to get a photo now? The public service ad for why we all should have worn sunscreen back in the day? I'm also curious if people are staying active as they get into their 60s. Most are not, unfortunately. But one exception is Annie, who I knew from a bunch of classes in high school and from the tennis team. Yeah, where, where have you been? Still still in Cambridge? Uh, I used to split my time between Cambridge and um, Rhode Island, but now I'm primarily in Rhode Island. Uh, uh-huh. During the pandemic, my mother had dementia, and I'm her health mm. proxy, so I had to go down and, and make sure that we kept her out of the hospital and, mm. and uh, healthy. She's since passed, but... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, um, now I'm, I'm really primarily in Rhode Island and very happy. Annie came from a big family and was one of the youngest of about five or six kids, if I remember correctly. I did vaguely recall she had a rough time growing up in our affluent town. There were financial difficulties. The house went up for auction at least once. And there were some years when Annie was absent an awful lot. I had horrible PTSD. I mean, hundreds of flashbacks. I documented them all, blah, blah, blah. Family, really, really difficult stuff. This was all from childhood. The condition that Annie confronted years later is known as complex PTSD, or CPTSD. It stems from longer periods of trauma and is characterized by debilitating emotional flashbacks. My interpretation of what is PTSD, it is like a blood-curdling scream silenced and suspended in time. Those of us who knew Annie back then, or classmates and friends, we should have reached out to her. But it was a much more private time. No social media, no smartphones. And on the whole, or at least on the surface, Annie seemed to be doing well in high school. She was always at the top of the class, despite those absences, and a great athlete too. Tennis, skiing, soccer. At the reunion, I wondered, what was she doing now that she'd moved from the city to the southern coast of New England, near Narragansett Bay? Are you a sailor? A lot of sailing down there? I'm not really a sailor. Uh, I I used to do a lot of board sailing, i.e. windsurfing. Um, But... Uh, I don't. I haven't been doing that so much lately. I've been swimming. Like, Masters Club type of thing. No, no. I do. I swim in the ocean primarily. Uh, sometimes in the river. So. Wow. Yeah. With anyone or are you? <laughs> Only the animals. <laughs> wow. So you're into it. I'm really into it. It's my new favorite sport. I'm Robert Pease, and this is My Body Odyssey, a podcast about the rewards and challenges of open water swimming this episode for anxiety issues like PTSD with our protagonist, Atlantic Annie. We wanted to learn firsthand about Annie's experiences with swimming. So a few months after that reunions chat, I met her at her favorite swimming spot on the southern New England shore, where despite the risks, Annie usually swims alone and long after the lifeguards are gone. Yeah, I I certainly think the social benefits sound great. Um, For me, I have a lot of self-discipline, so I I don't need the the personal goal to get me out here. Annie also swims at a really high level, but she'd never want to compete in the sport. You know, I've heard the, the saying that comparative is the great killer of joy. And this is pure fun for me. Uh, And I also don't, I've had so much competition in my life, I don't need more. The benefits Annie gets from open water swimming are more valuable to her than social connections or athletic accomplishment. 
because in her words, they are profoundly therapeutic. She likes to call this the saltwater cure. My love for this and the joy I get from being here is because I really feel a connection to nature. And I do think nature heals us. I mean, we know this now. PTSD can be as overwhelming as ocean waves and just as relentless. Yet much of that angst abates when Annie spends this half hour swimming through the ocean chop at the very same beach she first played on as a child. Yeah, in fact, when they took me out of the hospital, it was in August. This is after I was born. They brought me down here. I wouldn't be surprised if I was on this beach within, within the week. An, an immediate christening. <laughs> Yes, and I, I have a special affinity for this. And a lot of times if I'm in the city, first thing I do is I drive to this spot and uh, look out on the ocean. Uh, I just have this very deep connection that goes back 63 years. Wow. And yet you didn't really become, I think I'm correct, an open water swimmer in the avid sense of the term until much later. Right? Yeah. I about nine or ten years ago, I took swim lessons. I used to swim like a, an outboard motor. I mean, literally for about 50 years, I swam with my head up and uh, with way too much kick, and I would always wear myself out, but I would keep warm. But I never learned to swim properly until about nine or ten years ago. Learning to swim as an adult with some anxiety and a lot of bad habits, that's a big challenge. But inspired by the swimmers at the fitness club where she belonged, Annie was keen to take it on. I would do, be doing my stretching or working out on weight machines, and I would see the swimmers. And I'm very t drawn to uh, beautiful athletes, and uh, I noticed there were a couple of swimmers, women in particular, who were really graceful and beautiful. And I was kind of drawn and intrigued, and I thought at one point, I really, I think I, I should learn to swim properly, because I could tell that wasn't what I was doing. Smooth, efficient swimming, that may appear effortless to the observer, but it's also highly technical. The high elbow, the water catch, maintaining body balance while both kicking and rotating, Annie found a good swim coach who made a huge difference. And uh, so we'd spend a little time at the beginning of each um, swim lesson just getting used to the aqueous environment. You know, getting attuned, you're in a different space, different physics. Um, and, you know, blow bubbles for four seconds. And this was the best part. He taught me to breathe on the other, on the left side. And I literally thought that would be impossible. So he was... Why, why, why did you think it would be impossible? Did you have fear of the water? No, I ha well, I had some trauma in my life and I didn't like, I mean, that whole idea of breathing on, on a side that you're not used to was psychologically, um, made me feel anxious. So being able to feel, okay, you've got your, your, your you're going to stay afloat. And then being able to focus on the mechanics of the arm was a breakthrough for me. And it was well worth it because when I swim, do open water swimming, I need to be able to breathe on both sides for safety purposes. Short time later, Annie was able to take this newfound fascination with swimming out of the indoor pool and into the open water, or at first the semi-open water. Yeah. Um, after I had the lessons in the summer, I would wait until the water was warm enough, uh, typically, let's just say, around the 1st of June, and I would come out, and I initially started in the river, which is about a half mile away, and quieter water. Um, it's near the mouth of the, of the harbor, so near the open ocean but a little warmer and um, less chop and less waves. And I would, I would swim there. A lot more animals, though, <laughs> and outboard motors. Hey, it's Rob Pease here with a quick PSA for those tempted to try open water swimming. First, learn to swim in a pool with an instructor, as Atlantic Annie did before she attempted the open water. Then find an open water group near you with safety protocols. Equally important, our expert this episode, Dr. Heather Massey, she recommends a medical assessment before you take that first cold water plunge. Going into cold water is an extreme activity. And in people that have any underlying conditions, so heart conditions, 
very high blood pressure, this would really be something that wouldn't be a good idea to start with. So checking that you're fit and healthy is uh, always a good starting point. Now back to the episode. The beach where Atlantic Annie swims, that looks south towards Martha's Vineyard and the open water. It's dotted by large rock formations looming over the water as if pondering whether to roll upward onto the beach. But Annie swims between these rocks several times a week for as long as weather permits, and some days when it really doesn't. I swam a week ago in the um, tropical storm Ophelia, and that was a very different thing. So I was really getting blasted by the, by the um, chop. Uh, and then literally, it feels like it slaps you in the face sometimes. It was raining, and I think I was the only one on the beach. But it was a different experience, and it was beautiful. But today, on our visit to the shoreline, the water is unseasonably calm. It's like all these uh, thousands of jewels just glinting. Um, one after another, and the water is very, what do I say, it's a silver gold color that's lovely, and it's, it's exciting. I mean, you, you see it in front of you, and it, it's almost like looking into a beautiful blue sky. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a feeling in your solar plexus that just relates to it. After talking a bit more, I did join Annie for a swim, but really couldn't keep up for long. Her technique is really advanced. So I gave up and waited on shore for her to finish. It was probably about a one-mile swim at a really good clip. So, just out of the water, uh, how was it uh, today relative to most days? Um, I would say on a scale of one to 10, I was thinking this is a nine. Wow. I feel that good. Wow. Um, and the only thing that could be any better from my perspective would be maybe a little warmer, um, but that's okay. Um, this is maybe healthier for me. And, uh, and the wind, if, uh, if there were a little less wind. So well, I hate to bring this up, but here's kind of a test of whether it was a nine. Did you think at all about car repair? Because I know you have a car <laughs> repair issue. <laughs> You know, I, that was gone. I did not ruminate. I don't wow. think on anything. I was wondering if you were where you where you might be, but um, no. Yeah. And I, I arrived at the rock over down at the other end sooner than I had expected, which was nice too. And then I was swimming, and I probably had I did have the wind at my back too, so um, that was helpful. But no, I did not ruminate about that. And uh, it went by faster than I had thought, too. I wondered if Annie could describe how she felt physically and emotionally after a great swim on a near-perfect day. I feel as though almost invincible. I realize I'm not. You know, I've lived enough years. But I, you know, I come out of the water and it's, wow, I feel like a kid again. I feel what would it, almost elastic which is a very cool sense because there's not really any tension in the body. It just feels like this springiness and um, energy, even though I, I worked pretty hard as I was going and I did the sprints. I had a little extra at the end, so I did the sprints with the um, fins on, which is always fun. Yeah, because you feel like you're a, a true fish. You're swimming like a fish. So it was fun. And on clearer days, Annie can see a variety of fins swimming all around her. Sometimes I see striped bass, and they will be right near you. Uh, sometimes I see minnows, um, but it's always exciting. Occasionally I'll see a seal. And, you know, one day I was out here in October, and I was swimming right in front of the big rock. And I was on my back, and I had taken just a few strokes, backstroke. And I looked, and I, and I looked, and there was this little face. It looked like a little old man's face right in front of me. And it was a seal. Now, I did not feel afraid. And uh, I always know I'm never swimming alone. From where we stood, it sure looked like Annie's swimming alone. But at least today, there's a few other people on the beach. But that's not how Annie sees it. Because I swim, I oftentimes swim without hu other humans. Um, because I'm sharing something. We're all sharing something. And I think it's... It's, it's part of the way I feel connected to the earth um, and that 
and that would be true if someone said, are you alone? Because that's a great question. Because for a lot of my life, makes me have a little catch in my throat, I did feel alone. And I don't feel alone any longer. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful place to be. After the swim and a short walk on the beach to dry off, we sat down to talk to Annie outside a beach house, now closed for the season, the ocean behind us. Maybe a dozen people on the beach in the early afternoon, some having lunch, others walking dogs. There's one or two testing the temperature of the water, but not for long. So very likely not experiencing the full benefits Annie derives from these open water swims. I love the way I feel after, and I love the experience itself. Um, I feel this profound sense of calm after I, um, after I swim and have been in for quite a while. And um, I haven't found many things that uh, are equal to that, and many sports where I feel such a sense of calm, but even more so when I swim. And when I first started swimming, I noticed that my pulse, which is pretty low because I do a lot of, diff I do a lot of fitness activities, uh, let's say low 50s, uh, I do, typically will test it, my resting pulse at night. I noticed that it had dropped by five, eight, 10 beats per minute. Annie is by no means alone in experiencing this change. People have sent me their Garmin watch information about their resting heart rate and told me when their periods of, of regular outdoor swimming have been compared to when they haven't swum outdoors. Dr. Heather Massey is a senior lecturer in sport, health, and exercise science at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. She's also a member of the Extreme Environments Laboratory team, and she's an avid open water swimmer. The one thing that cold water swimming is, it's what we call a perturbation. And it totally disrupts what the status quo within the body, putting the body in a position where it needs to respond and react to uh, the stimulus, that cold water. And it could well be that this is the latest stimulus that, that Annie has experienced. So with repetition of that cold water swimming, that her resting heart rate has gradually dropped. On the other side of the Atlantic, Annie was doing her own research and discovering that reduced pulse is part of the mammalian diving reflex, essentially what the body instinctively does to prioritize functions while cold water swimming. And I started looking into it and I noticed there were some articles on what happens to, your, to you when you dive into the sea or when your face in particular, your face is immersed in cool water and we're talking you know, below 70 or 68 degrees and that it actually does change your pulse. It change your, changes our physiology as humans. Um, and we, I think we've become more like sea mammals. And it's apparently um, activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which I have come to understand over the last 10 years, is our relaxation response. It's what's activated when we sleep, when we rest, when we repair, when we're, we're with, with our favorite pet, um, with a lover. Um, and I was getting that by swimming. Dr. Massey cautions, there's much research to be done to understand the mammalian diving reflex, which involves the combined effects of immersion in nature, water, and cold temperature, while also swimming. But at least part of the reflex, the cold, watery part, that's well understood. We do this as a student practical every year where we not only do we immerse the student's face in cold water, but we also look at what happens when they immerse their face in warm water. And we do see that the dive reflex is not as pronounced in warm water immersions as it is in cold water immersions. And that's down to the fact that it hasn't stimulated that the vagus nerve to the same extent in the warm water as it does in cold water. The vagus nerve is something like our main control unit for the parasympathetic nervous system, including heart rate, digestion, and immune response. In Atlantic Annie's case, vagus nerve stimulation in open water has made her less prone to sudden anxiety on land. It's as if her body's learned the difference between a real and present threat, like drowning, and the memory of a threat. I wondered if Annie felt most of this transformation when she first began to swim a decade ago, 
or has this calming effect continued to grow? I think that's a, an interesting question to ponder. I, I haven't thought about it a lot, but I do think, um, yeah, because we're being tested all the time. Our nervous systems, uh, you know, with stress, various stressors, as I said, you know, the minor and major. And so um, I think as I get to be a better swimmer, um, I know I'm relaxing more in the water. And uh, it's also enabling me, I think, to use it more to, um, what would I say, reduce any anxiety or uh, negative feelings or um, difficult uh, moods or whatever. For Annie, that de-stressing process is vitally important because of the childhood trauma she experienced, which resurfaced with a vengeance decades later. I had my nose broken, I had my back fractured. I had to process all the components of loss associated with that trauma. Which set her on an odyssey to understand the roots of that trauma and find ways to weaken its grip. And I knew when I first started having the flashbacks that I had this sense of inner disquiet. I did not know what it was. I now know it was anxiety. And it was basically a chronic anxiety. Grief gets stuck in the body. It is almost like a living, breathing creature. Annie then went through a long process of dealing with PTSD. So I went through 19 years of really healing, using every tool at my disposal, fortunately, and I was determined to do it drug-free. Um, I believe that trauma happens, shit happens, but it doesn't have to be a life sentence. So, uh, yes, I mean, I had this super busy, stressed life. It was my way, my workaholism was my way of keeping away from the feelings because ac busyness, activity masks feelings. We should emphasize here, swimming did not magically diminish Annie's PTSD. She'd already made progress by the time of those first swim lessons. But open water swimming these past 10 years has brought her to a calmer, more resilient place and helps her stay there, despite the inevitable stress in her lives, the barrage of media, family members yelling past each other, money issues, and car repairs. So I, I'm just, it's a hard thing to answer because I had already gotten to this more relaxed place. And yet, no, I still deal with lots of stress, but I don't have PTSD. I have PTSD light because of the social environment, because of the, you, you know, this feel, this, um, but I'm, it's part of the process. Hurt people hurt people, but I have a story to tell. I do. I mean, you can tell. I got a story. I want to tell it. And I, I think people need to, can benefit from it, let's put it that way, because I figured some things out. It's now mid-afternoon, the sun sinking, the tide receding, and the beach almost empty. But we've been talking long enough, it almost seems like Annie's ready for another swim. Well, um, you said you have a little bit of almost a nickname around here. Is she still out there? H have you been able <laughs> to impart, you know, your love of swimming and the potential benefits of swimming to anyone else? Or is it just really hard to convey that to someone who hasn't experienced it? I think what really changes people is when they want to change. I had a, there was a couple of funny remarks when I was doing my fitness routines and my swims and uh, my swim going back and forth. And one of the guys made a comment to his wife, oh, I should be out there doing that. Um, and, and she said a lot of the guys were saying, oh, they all should be out there doing that. I don't know why guys were thinking they should do it instead of women. Um, everybody needs it. So I don't know. I don't worry about it. I just think that I need to do my thing, and hopefully I'll be an example 
we're getting closer to the end of your swimming season, there'll be this long period of time, we won't be able to swim at least in the same way. What does it feel like that first day in the spring when you're able to get back in the water? I am so excited. I am exhilarated. Um, it's usually kind of chilly, <laughs> you know, the first couple times. So many people don't realize how important play is for us. You know, that it's how we learn. It's how we re renew ourselves. And um, so I get very excited. And I'm kind of like a kid, you know, a kid getting out on my bike again in the spring. And it's like, wow, I'm gonna, I have a whole season ahead of me. Thanks to Atlantic Annie for sharing the challenges of her PTSD and the many benefits she derives from open water swimming, the immersion in nature, proximity to marine life, the great cardio workout, but also that mammalian diving reflex, which she feels makes her calmer, more resilient once back on land with all us other mammals. We hope to catch up with Annie at the beginning of next year's open water swimming season when all of those benefits come washing back over her. Thanks also to Dr. Heather Massey for her expert insights as a researcher who swims and a swimmer in a really interesting field of research. We'll hear more from Dr. Massey in our next premium episode on Apple subscriptions. Next up for our season two finale on My Body Odyssey, a wintry visit to Vermont for a conversation with Nordic John. He's 80 years young, but still practices and competes internationally in cross-country skiing, despite the decade-long challenge of Parkinson's disease. Now, as you can see, I have a lot of extraneous movement in my legs and my arms. Um, and that's very symptomatic, Parkinson's. But also because of that Parkinson's, John is as committed a skier today as at any point in his many decades of skiing locally in Vermont, as well as competitively throughout North America and Europe. Well, I haven't had any medical people tell me that I shouldn't go as hard as possible. It is really effective when you push yourself to the limit. We hope you'll join us for that episode. Tell a friend or two about the show and review us on Apple Podcasts. We're also looking for sponsors for the next season of My Body Odyssey. We appreciate any and all ideas. You can reach us through our website, mybodyodyssey.com, and through social media. My Body Odyssey is a Fluent Knowledge production with original music by Ryan Adair Rooney. I'm Robert Pease, wishing you happy holidays from the whole My Body Odyssey team. <laughs>